Good morning. And I want us to show some love and appreciation to the many speakers we have had this morning. I think they've been fantastic and they've been inspiring. I came here thinking that I was going to um, you know, leave by sharing something with you, but I think I've learned a lot more than I will be uh, sharing with you. So good morning once again. Um, I want to share something with you. The very long topic that she mentioned, Dream, Imagine, Explore, I've tried to distill it into something very simple that I want to share with you. Can I have the uh, control, please? So that um, I can share with you a few ideas about why I believe in Africa. That's essentially what I want to talk to you about this morning, why I believe in Africa. Uh, my name is Kujo Oponkrumah. Uh, like you, I am a young African. I'm 32 years of age today. Today actually happens to be my birthday. And today you may see me and you, know, you may say, oh, Charlie, you're looking good. Oh. But there's something I want to show you here. It's a photo of me 15 years ago. Boy, it's a bread. <laughs> now, who here doesn't have a photo like this? Every one of you has a photo like this tucked somewhere in their closet. But I wanted to show you this photo as a foundation as we start our conversation this morning about why I believe in Africa. Like you, I'm a young African who's got my own things that excite me, things that leave me troubled. Uh, there are things that frustrate me, things that leave me scared. And I'm very sure that you have some of those very same things. Some of the things that frustrate me here in Africa in Accra include traffic. I'm sure it frustrates you as well. There are things like corruption that make all of us mad when we listen to the radio and hear all the chatter every morning. When you turn on your taps and they are not running or you switch on the lights and they go off, there are things that frustrate us. There are things that scare me. I'm sure they scare you too. I'm getting scared at the increasing rate of robbery in our cities today. I'm getting worried when I see the population numbers go up and the employment numbers not necessarily go up. It worries me that in the very near future, we're going to see something we don't like. But those are some of the things that you know, get me scared or disappointed or worried. There are things also that excite me. And I'm sure some of those things excite you. Things like football. Who doesn't get excited by football? We're getting ready for the World Cup, and I'm sure we're going to win. You don't like football? <laughs> Uche doesn't like football. But I'm hoping that we're going to win the World Cup. Who shares that belief as well? I see. So football excites me, and I'm also excited by food. I'm sure food excites you as well, unless you're watching your finger. But in the last 10 years, as I've worked in media, eight of them at uh, Joy FM hosting the Super Morning Show, there is something that I really felt at the bottom of my heart, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. It's about dreams. Almost everybody has a dream. I think, you know, Paul was talking about dreams and sometimes some of the limitations to our dreams. Everybody has some kind of dream. And in the last eight years, as I worked on Joy FM, traveling up and down this country, interviewing all sorts of people, from big people to small people, and asking them, one of the things that really excites me to hear people talk about is their dreams. And believe me, I've had some great dreams and some crazy dreams as well. One of the dreams that always stays in my mind is a dream of a little, well, it's not a little girl, it's a young lady who was asked what she really wants to do. I think it was ahead of one of the elections, and we asked, what do you want to see yourself do in the next four or five years? She says, I want to have a little headpan so that I can have a little headpan shop. And in that little headpan shop, I will have a few brassiers and panties that I will sell. That's the size of her dream. That's the dream that that young lady has. You may laugh. But that's her dream. It's her worldview. It's a thing that she sees herself becoming. I spoke to another gentleman. What do you want to do in the next three, four years? So, me, I want to own a little check, check joint so that I can sell anointed rice. You know anointed rice? <laughs> that's what you call anguamo. It's rice, you know, done with a bit of oil and just a bit of sauce. That's his dream as well. He wants to have a little check, check joint so that he can sell a bit of rice. Those are dreams you may consider small dreams. But I've also had some very big dreams. I've had somebody say, I want to be president so that I can rule the country and fix all the problems that seem to be going awry in this country. And then I've had other people say, I, I want to be president of the Organization of African Union. Put all the 54 together for me. 
and I will deal with it in a way that you know, delivers more value than you could ever imagine. Highfalutin dreams that I've also heard people speak about. But between the highfalutin dreams and what you may consider the small dreams is one dream that I've really fallen in love with. It's a dream of a very young boy I met a few years ago. And I'm using this picture to depict him as I tell you his dream. His dream is a dream of an average Ghanaian kid. And when I say an average Ghanaian kid, please don't think of all the kids who go to GIS and all the big schools here in Accra. Think about the average Ghanaian child in Ghana today. And this young boy tells me something that blows me uh, out of my headphones sitting in the studio. He tells me that his dream is to own a Gulfstream jet. Yeah, a Gulfstream jet. Now, for those who know a little bit about aviation, a Gulfstream jet, this is one of the most powerful private jets you could ever have. There are two things that are exciting about it. Even when the pilot cannot see, whether it's in the dark or during daytime, it's got infrared attributes that allows you to sense when there's something that's close by the aircraft. It's got high-tech features. It has uh, you know, some controlled landing stuff that can even help the uh, air control guys pulling the aircraft if the pilot is having difficulties. Why on earth would an average Ghanaian child who's struggling with his own school uniform and his school feeding program dream of owning a Gulfstream 5 jet? What excited me was not so much about you know, the jet and what it can do, but it was about how this young lad, or how this lad expects to get that jet and what he plans to do with it. So here's the little story that he told me. He tells me that there are a lot of little problems that he sees around him. And he thinks that one of the smartest ways to solve his personal problems and perhaps to make money is to solve some of the little problems around him and if he can solve some of those little problems and translate them into solving some problems in other towns and villages and maybe countries and cities, he gets paid a lot of good money for solving these little problems. He expects to be that guy who grows up the next 10, 15, 20 years to be a big problem solver across Africa, making big value for the problems that he's solving. And he expects that he won't have enough time to be loitering about in an airport queue, even if it's first class, you still wait in the queue with all of us. You don't get there earlier than we do even if you are sitting in first class or business class. So he says he expects that he'll be so busy hopping from meeting to meeting across Africa, solving problems, that he's going to need a Gulfstream 5 jet so that he can be running about. Now, here's what really excites me about this boy's dream. A few decades ago, the only people who dared to have this dream were some very old dictators on the African continent who stayed so long and took all the money and therefore they could afford some of these things. It didn't matter what they did or what they didn't do. Or in recent times, it's got to be the guy that we call the polypreneur, the so-called entrepreneur hiding behind the politician who gets past a few contracts that he doesn't deserve and he probably never even delivers a contract and gets paid big sums of money so that he can afford that kind of Gulfstream 5 jet. But here's a little guy who's saying that he's going to acquire that same thing, but he's going to do that by pondering and thinking through the little problems around him and putting together little bits of resources he can find, little bits of technology to address some of those problems so that while he solves them here in Achimoda or moves to um, Ejubie and some other villages close by, he can begin to move from city to city, country to country, solving big problems. And that's how he expects to get value for it. Now here's why I have hope for Africa. I have hope for Africa because every single day I meet a lot of young people who are living this boy's dream. A lot of young people who at your level and at my level are thinking through how to solve some of the very simple problems around us. Yes, we know they are governments. Yes, we know they are development partners. And yet, we'll continue to demand on the radio and television and the newspapers of them to do more and to deliver better value. But you and I need to try changing a bit of our mindset to start asking ourselves, what problem can I solve in this little community? What value can I create in this little community of mine. And I want to share with you the stories of a few guys I have known who have done some of this. The reason is that Africa has a lot of problems. We know that, don't we? 
and it has a lot of opportunities. The problems get us scared and angry and annoyed, as I told you about earlier, and they also get us excited when we see the opportunities. And as I mentioned, it's not going to take any government or any development partners to fix it. It's going to take the young guys like you and myself, who like this young kid, who spend time thinking through how to fix them, how to create value, and how to get rewarded for them. There's a gentleman I met a few years ago. His name is Bright Simmons. Who doesn't know Bright Simmons here? Or who knows Bright Simmons? Maybe let me put it that way. Bright Simmons went to Presec. He didn't go to Yale University. He went to Presec right here in Accra. And he studied the same textbooks that you and I studied. And he was troubled, just like you and I, about the fact that we are seeing a lot of counterfeit drugs on our Ghanaian market. But while you and I were shouting that, what is the Food and Drugs Authority doing? And what is government doing? Bright Simmons said, how do I help solve this problem? So he developed a single technology called M-Pedigree. So that when you buy the pill the next time, you can actually just text a little barcode on it and verify from a server whether that drug that you bought is genuine or it's fake. This young man is making a lot of money. I won't be surprised to see him in a Gulf Stream 5 jet in the near future. But he's doing that by solving a little problem that you and I both see. Yet we choose to complain, and he chooses to think about how to solve that problem. There's a young lady to the left of the screen, or to the right of the screen. Her name is Miss Abiola. She's from Nigeria. And she's seen a lot of waste around Lagos and low-income communities around Lagos, and asking herself, how do I connect these people from low-income communities to solving the waste problem of Lagos? I encourage you to Google her up and see what she's doing to solve that. Most of you are high-tech guys, so I'm sure you'll figure it out. I want to take you back to two other slides that I sought um, to show you. This is a young man called uh, William. He's from Malawi. I'm sure many of you have heard his story. He grew up in a house in which there was no electricity, and he always wondered, how do I get electricity in my house? And as he kept learning and reading, he saw a windmill in a book. And he asked himself, how do I do this to create electricity for my home? The little resources he had around him, he started putting them together. He used some old bicycle parts, branches of a tree, and he built a windmill. Today, he's built windmills that pump water in his village and are solving little problems. Now, would you be surprised to see him in a Gulf Stream 5 jet in the near future? You shouldn't be surprised. And there's another uh, lady, Nkem. Again, she's from Nigeria. I don't know whether you know, Nigerians are doing to take all my examples today. She's also using a lot of software to uh, help provide educational opportunities in communities uh, where they cannot necessarily extend brick and mortar classrooms there. These are young Africans who went to the same schools that you and I went to and are doing fantastic things to solve problems right here in Africa. Now, I think that Africa needs more of these people. And I see more of these people showing up on a daily basis. As you read through the TED brochure this morning, I'm sure you're excited about the many examples of young people who you see right here doing exciting things. And that's what excites me about Africa. There are four things that I want to share with you today that maybe if we are not doing already, maybe all of us can do. And as we do them, we should become one of these examples at the next TED, TEDx Laboni talk. What do you say? Good idea? The common thread you find among all of these examples and the many examples that you find in your brochure today is that number one, all of these guys spend some time to build capacity. So if you look at William, he spent some time to read and research how to build his own windmill. He wasn't waiting for uncles and aunties and governments and civil society partners to help him do it. He built his own capacity. Yes, we'll continue to demand, but all of us have a certain responsibility to build our own capacity in whatever area that we feel we're called to make a contribution. I deal with a lot of young business people, and one of the things they always talk about is that, I want to do this fantastic thing, but the problem is that I don't have the capital to do it. <laughs> Newsflash, here in Africa, we don't have that many venture capital and private equity companies that are willing to throw money at your nice little creative idea. We don't have a lot of banks that will say that they are taking somebody's deposit to risk on your highfalutin venture. But what we need to do is to start gathering resources. Many of us don't like partnerships, partnering with somebody else who has a similar idea, or maybe who just has the money but doesn't have the idea. We need, at a very early age, to start building the necessary partnerships, gathering the resources. And as we begin to put together a little bit of mine, a little bit of yours, and a little bit of hers, we'll begin to find the little resources that we have that can get us on a path. I was at a program. I'll show you the gentleman just last night. And he's a shoemaker. I'm wearing one of his shoes. He's a shoemaker. And 
you know, he's just been doing it from hand to mouth for about four years now. And yesterday, somebody told him that, listen, if you can do ABC, I'll get you a $5 million contract. He started with the little that he has. He's gathered resources, pulled money with a few guys, and they are on their way there. I won't be surprised to see him hitting that Gulfstream jet sometimes and when somebody else is in the queue at Kotoka International Airport. The third thing I want to talk to you about is to start with whatever little you have. Very often, all of us want to see some big capital base before we take off. I'm a Christian. I like to quote from the Bible. When God saw the young Israelites that he wanted to send him off, he said, what do you have in your hand? He said, I have a staff. He says, use it. Whatever you have in your hand, no matter how little it is, that's where you start from. It's not going to start from a $10 million youth development fund that you're expecting to get because you and I both know you need to know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody before you can get into that fund. But it's probably going to start with whatever little you have in your hand that you can piece together with other people. And then the final thing I want to talk to you about this morning is excellence. I'm sure you're familiar, those who speak Chi or Fanti or any of their Khan dialects, you're familiar with the expression, Ahasidye, Sanye, you know. True or false? We are very fond of being comfortable with our own little standards. But the world, as you know today, is a global village. Whatever you're producing here, somebody probably sitting in Thailand is competing with you, like it or not. And the power of the internet allows him or her to market it to the same customer in the UK that you are targeting. So if we don't strive to make tomorrow better than what we did today, if we don't strive for excellence every other day, there's absolutely no way we are going to compete out there on the world stage and do a great job at it. So the final thing I want to share with you is that we should work towards excellence on a daily basis. And as we go through some of these things, I am sure that we will be blessed with the great fortune of finding little problems we can solve in one village at a time, one city at a time, one country at a time, and in 53 other countries across Africa. I have a little photo collage of young Ghanaians, many of whom you know them. They don't have two brains. They didn't go to any exceptional school. They went to the very same schools you and I went to. They studied the very same boring educational subject that we always talk about, that the same notebooks that your uncle uses, the same one, they did the same thing. But they are changing their mindset and they are doing something great on the African continent. And I want to encourage you that you can do this. If you are thinking that, well, yeah, that one is a nice idea, but it's not my type. That one is a nice idea, but maybe it's not my calling. I want to show you the photo again of the guy who I showed you 15 years ago. Remember that, that skinny guy with the big suit who I said, I'm sure everybody has a photo like. That's myself. I'm going to show you a photo of myself um, quite recently. And in 15 years, if I've been able to walk a path from that young guy in junior high school, standing here telling you about a 10-year career I have had, um, I am sure that you can do a lot more than I have probably even done, even in this past time, and take it forward. And if you are wondering whether or not you can do it, my little comment to you that it's possible. Anytime I tweet, I like to add a little hashtag to it, it's possible. I like to encourage you that when you send out a tweet, spend some time, send out a tweet, encourage somebody about what they can do to create value for themselves and for the African continent. And if you don't mind, just add that little hashtag as we encourage ourselves, it's possible. Thank you.